Welcome to Firearms Friday, coming to you from the Wyoming State Museum here in Cheyenne. I'm Evan Green. I'm the firearms historian for the museum. So, in this series of videos, we're talking about the long guns, mostly rifles and one shotgun, that were produced by the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. And as I've noted before, the Springfield Armory was established in 1777 to manufacture firearms for the Revolutionary War. It stayed in that business manufacturing guns for the American military until it was closed in 1968. And there is a firm, a uh, company that both imports and manufactures firearms called Springfield Armory. They have no connection whatsoever with the original government installation. They were created as a company in 1974. They too, in fact, make some replicas or copies of some of the firearms that were made by the original armory. So we have now the kind of final version of the Springfield Trapdoor Rifle. In 1872-73, the military conducted trials to select a new uh, issue long gun, rifle and carbines, and a new revolver. And uh, 73 was a good year because that was the year that the Colt Single Action Army was adopted and the year that the Trapdoor Springfield was adopted. So looking back, we've seen Springfield military rifles in 69 caliber, 58 caliber, 50 caliber, and now we're down to 4570. So the 1873 Trapdoor Springfield, everything functioned just like the earlier conversion, but it was manufactured from scratch as new, called a trapdoor because of the way that breech opens. These were uh, fairly efficient. Uh, they were accurate, they shot a substantial cartridge, and they were the issue firearms to the military from 1873 until about 1892 when another Springfield Armory rifle replaced them. They still continue to see use. A lot of these were issued to state militias and state volunteer units for the Spanish-American War in uh, 1898 and the subsequent uh, American-Philippine War in uh, 1899. That one lasted in some forms in, well into the 20th century. So again, this was the issue rifle. Cartridge was a 4570, And uh, again, quite, quite an interesting and very efficient firearm. They were also in use in Cuba by regular units, I think. And that might have been volunteer units. They were used in Cuba during the Spanish-American War as well as in the Philippines, where regular troops, again, were issued a different Springfield Armory rifle. So that's the infantry rifle. We're going to take a look at the carbine. Okay, moving right along. Now we're looking at the cavalry carbine version of the 1873 Trapdoor Springfield. Uh, this one has uh, was issued with this ring and bar, and the firearm was secured with an over-the-shoulder strap uh, that attached to this ring with a snap hook. And it was often uh, enhanced with a boot or a short scabbard that maintained, that controlled the barrel of the firearm so that when you're galloping along on your horse, this thing doesn't beat your leg to death uh, while you're in motion. These, this is a really nice example. It's so nice, in fact, that I suspect the stock might have been refinished, but there's, there's no gap. There's no gap between the uh, me metal parts and the wood, so maybe it just survived in really good condition. This was the primary firearm that was carried by the 7th Cavalry at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And there's kind of a, everybody's looking for, well, I won't say everybody, lots of people are looking for excuses why Custer was wiped out at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. 
some people go as far as to say, well, gee, Sitting Bull trained under Napoleon in cavalry tactics. Well, uh, no, I don't think that happened. Uh, Custer was outgeneraled, he was outmaneuvered, and he was vastly outnumbered. And I think he made some mistakes in the deployment of his troops. But one of the other things that came up was that instead of brass cartridges, the original cartridges for these firearms were copper. And brass is a bit more flexible in that what happens when you fire a cartridge the brass expands slightly to seal the breech. It's called obduration. And the copper cartridges are somewhat more brittle and less likely to create an effective seal. So you get corrosion and debris in the breech. And it was claimed that was a reason that some of the troopers were unable to stay in the fight because their guns jammed. They couldn't get that copper cartridge out. And when they flipped open that trap door, the extractor ripped off the rim of that copper cartridge. And they were in trouble at that point if it happened as often as it is speculated that it did because the carbine does not come with a cleaning rod. So the way to clear that jam would have been to put a cleaning rod down the bore and knock that out. The other option they had was to try and use a knife or a tool of some kind to get that thing out of the chamber. Not the sort of thing you want to be messing with while you're surrounded by angry Native Americans. I don't think this one... This one does have a trap door in the butt plate. It's a later model that actually has the cleaning rod in the, in a three-piece cleaning, cleaning rod inside the butt of the carbine. So uh, there, there is one, one version I've read of the fight at Reno Hill was that one of the civilian packers had a rifle with a ramrod and he was kept busy going around that entrenchment knocking out those stuck cartridges. And to, to, the, to what extent that happened, I don't know. Uh, one of the best, one of my favorite books about the Battle of the Little Bighorn is called Archaeological Perspectives on the Battle of the Little Bighorn. In mid-1980, there was a grass fire, brush fire, at the battlefield site. And that opened up the grounds. Guys, archaeologists, Forensic archaeologists, in some cases, went in with metal detectors, and they were e able to retrieve bones and horseshoes and broken knives and cartridge cases and bullets. One of the fascinating things was that they could confirm by analyzing the uh, imprints on a bullet that a, uh, a, either a Henry or a Winchester 1866 was used both at Last Stand Hill and at the Reno Hill fight because they could, they could confirm that it came from the same gun used in both places. So anyway, that, that's pretty interesting, but the point I was trying to get around to is that they did not find much evidence of either knives that had been broken trying to extract it or damaged cartridges with that rim ripped off. The caveat is this was in 18 or 1980. It's 110 years after the fight. That battleground had been picked over repeatedly by uh, tourists and pe unauthorized people, really, picking up stuff from that battlefield. So I won't take it as conclusive, but again, if you're really interested in uh, some of this analysis, I'd recommend that book highly. Archaeological Perspectives on the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Okay, we got one more trapdoor to look at. What we have here is called a Forager Shotgun. It is a conversion of a trapdoor Springfield rifle to a 20 gauge shotgun. One of the issues on the frontier forts back in these days, the mid to late 19th century, is supply problems. These forts were isolated. Uh, they were occasionally 
isolated by storms or blizzards in the wintertime. So providing rations to the troops was sometimes difficult. And the rations were usually not of the best quality. There's pretty well-documented evidence of scurvy at some of these forts. I mean, they'd known for 75 years that what causes scurvy. You don't have fresh vegetables. You don't have, they don't have citrus fruits. You don't have that uh, vitamin C to prevent scurvy. So in an attempt to, a couple things happened in an attempt to improve the quality of rations. One was they encouraged the individual troopers to plant gardens. I've tried to raise gardens in Wyoming for 20 years, and maybe five or six years you get a frost-free period uh, that enables you to harvest your crop. Or, uh, and some of these forts, they didn't get any rain, so the gardens were not always successful. The other thing that happened is that soldiers would go hunting they would, they would shoot big game, try to get small game uh, to add to their uh, diets at the posts. So General of the Army, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, in 1881 said, let's issue two shotguns to each unit at each fort and some brass cased 20 gauge shotgun shells so that they can go out and in addition to occasionally shooting a deer or an elk or uh, some other animal, large animal, they can hunt ducks and geese and quail and, and grouse and whatnot, small game. So we have two of these, oddly enough, in the collection and they are somewhat rare because there wasn't that many of them made. So okay, that's uh, the end of this section on Springfield rifles and this one shotgun. So if you have comments or questions, you can put those in the section below, or you can call the museum, leave your contact information, and I will get back to you. Thanks for watching.